Welcome back to my channel. Today we're looking at a bunch of different tips for how to improve your workflow within Photoshop. These are some of the tips and tricks I wish I knew when first starting out. The first tip we're looking at today will be creating a new window for us to work within. Within Photoshop, we normally use one canvas per file, but by going to window, arrange and opening a new window, it creates a duplicate window for the same canvas. So you could essentially have one canvas being really close zoomed in and the other one being a zoomed out part. The cool thing about this is it allows us to have two windows of the same canvas at different scales, which allowed us to both work on the big picture as well as the small picture. The best benefit of this for your workflow is that you can draw on both. It's not tied into just one screen. Where you are only adding an additional viewport, essentially you can use this for anything. So it can be text, it can be brushes, it can be shapes. If the ball's in your court, you can do whatever you need to do. The only thing is there's a slight lagging feature when drawing between the two windows as your Photoshop or your computer setup might not have the power to run both windows at the same time. So this is something to just bear in mind. Brushes have a bunch of different workflow styles which can improve the speed you draw with. So we got the default selecting a brush um, and drawing a straight line, but most times the lines will be wonky. If you press shift when you draw, it draws in a straight line. And the cool thing about this is it goes alongside the next tip. So if you press shift and click, it'll create a brush stroke between the two points. By pressing alt and right clicking, you are able to bring up this red version of a brush which shows you the type of mark the brush will make. So for instance, hard, soft, or at the scale. So it all depends on the movement you move your mouse in. You can also adjust the actual brush tip size and the style by um, right clicking on the brush and changing the orientation. You can also change the size of the spacing to create more dotted brushes or really smooth brushes for painting or general mark making. By using the number on the keyboard, you can actually change the opacity of the brush quite easily without having to go through the settings. By pressing one, you get an opacity of 10. By pressing one five, you get an opacity of 15. This also translates to the layer panel. So if you click a layer, you can also toggle the opacity based on the numbers you press. The next tool we're looking at is the frame tool. So this is very similar to um, a tool within InDesign if you've used it. What it allows us to do is create a general mask for an area within a composition, which we can then drag and drop different imagery in. So I'm just gonna be using a poster design for a moment. So if we just drag and drop this in, as you can see, it just drops it in. Um, but if we press Control T to bring up free transform, we can scale it up. The interesting thing about it is it already starts cropping out. So we can move it about and it will be only the area that we have masked out in the frame. Uh, we can also replace this using the regular um, relinking files to bring in alternative imagery. Within Photoshop, there's a million ways to do different things. So like filling the artboard, for instance. So we can go for the regular bucket, which is the paint bucket that just drops in the full color. Uh, we can also add in a solid, which you can choose from the color palette. Um, and it creates a solid with a mask. You can also drag the swatches into the layer panel and it will do the same. And then you can do the traditional, if you've got a brush, you can just paint in the area or you can press Alt Delete or Control Delete. It will fill the artboard with the foreground color or the background color. So when trying to create interesting images for social media or advertisement campaigns, using different colors can be a normal go-to. The problem when using the hue and saturation slider is the filter doesn't always work so well when trying to target specific colors or if an image is quite muddy with a bunch of different colors, it can be difficult to isolate specific values that you want to adjust. An interesting approach is using a gradient map. What this filter does is it allows you to use a gradient from black to white and adjust the values of the image to match whichever color palette you want. So for instance, you could substitute light to dot or add in a bunch of different colors to create a rainbow gradient. This tool doesn't have a one-stop shop fix for everything. So it's all about playing with it and experimenting as some images might work better with a brighter color palette, whereas others will might work better with more of a high contrasting color palette. You are not limited to just two colors. You can add multiple colors between to create a varied color palette. I find that using contrasting colors like this uh, red and yellow works quite well to create areas of high contrast and uh, areas of interest. So you can approach gradient maps by using an adjustment layer or you can create a duplicate layer of the initial image and then you can add a gradient map directly to it.
The problem with the latter is it creates a destructive workflow. Basically, as soon as you apply it, it's set. You can't edit it, you can't go back. So my approach is using an adjustment layer and having it set to everything underneath it. Because this way you can at least change the colors, you can change how it intense it looks without having to restart from the beginning. So let's grab another image of um, a person. So we're just going to grab just this image off of uh, Unsplashed. So we just download that and bring this into Photoshop. Gradient maps also work quite well on people. If the photo that we're using has got quite a high contrast, um, you can again create a similar effect where you've got high values um, which are bright and low values which are really dark. For some reason, my color palettes have been a bit flipped, so I just have to reverse them. And for instance, here, we've got this really nice pink tones, which can be supplemented with a softer yellow. So this is something you can kind of see on like a t-shirt or even like a homemade zine type thing. The cool thing about using these type of gradient maps is you can apply them to a bunch of different images and keep the same gradient map consistent. So the outcomes will all be matching. The next tip we're looking at is smart object. Creating smart objects is a way of using a graphic that acts like a protected file. So essentially you're adding effects on top of the file rather than the file itself. By converting a image into a smart object, you can actually use this to create mockups really quickly. So I've just grabbed this image off of Unsplash, which is just of a book. So by using the warp tool and the trans free transform, we're able to just drop this in to create a really quick mock-up of this book. And then by right clicking and going to warp, we can just drag the points down to make it flow in a similar way to the book. But as you can see, the person's hand, it gets kind of chopped off so we can mask that out. So if we just open a new mask using the brush tool, we can just paint out the thumb. And this is going to be really rushed just for the sake of this tutorial. But obviously, if you're doing this properly, you want to spend a bit of time and make sure the feathering around the thumb and the shadowing works. But the cool thing is if you double click the smart object, it brings up an option to bring in an alternative um, image. So you can just drag and drop new assets in. And if you save it, it will auto update the file. All right, so neural filters are a brand new feature to Photoshop. The idea of this is using Adobe Sensei's AI to create funky computer generated designs. So there's a few that we've got, like Super Zoom, which basically um, uses AI to upscale certain parts of an image. So you can use this to, if you've got like a nice like landscape shot, you can zoom into a specific region and play with the noise reduction as well as sharpness to create a really high quality image. So here, for instance, we've just zoomed into a portion. It's retained quite a lot of the detail without blurring anything too much. My favorite thing at the moment is to mess about with this uh, new feature called Style Transfer. So what you're doing is using a base layer, so this photo for instance, and you can apply different presets or image styles on top, which create like a really new way of designing assets. So for instance, this one makes the mountainscape look like a traditional painting. Uh, we've got different ones that do different things. Um, I've only downloaded a few just to try them out, but this is something that I think could be quite useful as it gets developed. The neural filters are still being developed, so there's only a few that are available. So here, for instance, we've got this other one called Color Transfer, which um, is similar to like a gradient map, but you're using an image source as a base. So this would be cool for matching imagery if you're trying to make a cohesive brand. These filters are still pretty new, so if they can be quite glitchy, I found that it has broken a couple times on me, so I've had to crash my Photoshop and restart it. But that's um, something you get when you're using new software. Hopefully you found some of these tips and tricks useful. If you did, please like and subscribe. It really helps the channel grow. Thank you.